At the start of the course, I said that there were at least two puzzles that we were going to try to make sense of. And the first was, why is the U.S. so different across so many dimensions from other rich democracies? And the answers that I've offered and that we've, we've done some readings about have been principally in two categories. One is the structure of our political institutions, right, which make policymaking in the U.S. more difficult, makes it more complex, more resistant to majority presser, pressures, more susceptible to elite interests. Um, and the second is the, the reverberating effects of the long legacy of white supremacy, uh, which has created this bifurcated welfare state that has advantaged one population while at the same time disadvantaging another. So things like poverty and inequality are worse in the U.S. because the government does less to reduce them than do governments in other rich democracies. And that reason is not, I submit, because we have some sort of distinct political culture, but that we have unusual institutions and policymaking structures. The second puzzle, of course, a related but distinct one, is revealed on the chart here, which I think you've now seen a couple of times. Right. What happened in the immediate post-World War II period that led to high economic growth and growth that was distributed pretty equitably across all segments of the population? And why more recently have only people at the very top of the income and wealth distribution benefited while income has stagnated or even declined for the rest of the population? And, and why, as that second chart in the corner there shows, why has economic mobility been in decline in this more recent period too? Put differently, why have we returned to levels of income and wealth inequality that we haven't seen since the 1920s? Why have we seen so little economic progress for so many in the last decades especially? Remember, right, this is not just a story about poor and low-income people, but about the decline of the American middle class as well. So... Let's start by trying to make sense of that post-World War II period from the 1940s to the 1970s, a period that economist Paul Krugman has called the Great Compression, when inequality declined and the white middle class emerged. There are two things, remember, that we need to explain. Why were there such high levels of economic growth compared to the more recent period, thing one, and two, why is it that so many people benefited from that growth? It's entirely possible, and perhaps even likely, that the high levels of U.S. economic growth in the post-World War II period were an anomaly, the product of some very unusual circumstances that are unlikely to be recorded, repeated. Because not only did the U.S. not to have, have too much international competition in the wake of that war, as other industrial powers had to rebuild in ways that we didn't, but the broad range of new economic institutions that we helped to create after World War II were structured to give us some trade and finance advantages that allowed us to dominate the international markets for a while. Meanwhile, right, the pent-up demand at the end of the war unleashed among U.S. consumers helped spur our own economy, as did the creation of the national highway system under Eisenhower, which served not just as this massive jobs program, but made possible both the construction of the suburbs and the radical expansion of the automobile industry, which drove the U.S. economy for decades. So those factors are, I think, the big ones that help explain why the economy was booming. But what about the distributional piece of this, right? Why did so many people reap the benefits of that growth? If economics explains growth, I think it's politics that has to explain distribution. It is, I think, possible that the U.S. working class has never been more powerful than it was around the 1940s, thanks to historically high rates of unionization, at least by U.S. standards, continued mass movement pressures that were pushing the political system to respond in ways that ordinarily it does not, the continued expansion of the national welfare state that was erected in the 1930s, especially the provisions of the GI Bill, which offered free education, health care, and cheap homes, arguably creating something of a Swedish welfare state for veterans, 
All of that made possible by very high tax rates on wealthy individuals and corporations to fund this expansion of the white middle class and even the beginnings of a black middle class. It's also, I think, not coincidental that throughout much of the 20th century, the Democratic Party controlled Congress. And while the Democrats are, and especially then, have always been a mixed bag at best, all else equal in the 20th century, they have been more likely to champion policies that improve the well-being of poor and working people. So let's go back there just for, whoops, sorry. Give me time to look through that before we tip on. All right, so what happened in the more recent period, right? So how, what, what, what is it that happened to reverse those trends? So again, if we can separate economic and political causes for the post-World War II expansion of opportunity, I think we can do the same thing for the more recent contraction of opportunity or the move away from greater equality to greater inequality, what Krugman in this period calls the Great Divergence. So first, we need to explain why economic growth levels have been so much lower. And I think part of the answer is that that unusual post-World War II global economic conditions in which the U.S. had less competition, those conditions changed. Other industrial powers in Europe and then Asia emerged to compete with U.S. companies. But the advent of new technologies and increasing computerization also changed the kind of jobs that were available and what skills were required for them helping to create what some people have called an hourglass economy today, right? Lots of high paying jobs at the top that require advanced education and sophisticated skills, and then lots of low wage jobs at the bottom providing support services to those people, right? Cleaning their homes, washing their clothes, serving them coffee, with fewer and fewer good jobs in the middle like those that the auto industry used to provide, which didn't require too much by way of formal education. The second piece uh, is, is something that, that is, is often thought about as, as the backlash of the late 1960s and early 70s, right? So even as growth declined, fewer people benefited from it. And this was in some ways an intentional result of the mobilization of corporate and wealthy individuals who by the beginning of the 1970s really felt that they'd been losing ground in the post-war period and sought to retain their advantage, right? This is at the heart of what Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, uh, the story that they tell in a book called Winner Take All Policy, that, 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 that it's this right-wing conservative business-driven mobilization that starts to institutionalize efforts to roll back that more equitable distribution and regulation of that post-war period. That's coupled with another kind of mobilization, right? This also starts in the 1970s, and this is uh, a mobilization not of the economic right, but of the, 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 the religious right, the, the, the Christian evangelical right in particular. And they're responding not to increased rates of taxation and increased regulation on business and individuals, but responding to the other kinds of upheavals of the social of the 1960s, right? The, the, the social upheavals, uh, the, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, uh, these efforts to undermine what they understood to be the traditional and, as they would have it, rightful form and structure of the American family, right? And of course, you see a lot of overlap here, and the overlap here is generally this is white Americans, and this tends to be white Americans with money, whether we're talking about the business conservatives or whether we're talking about the conservatives on the religious right. And all of this, and we could argue about sort of what's cause here and what's effect here, is taking place as we see pretty steady declines of the rate of unionization for American workers from its peak in the 1940s to what continues to be an erosion of power among working people. And one of the things that means is that there's simply fewer opportunities to push back against employers and that weakens workers and strengthens people with money. Likewise, we've got a decline in other kinds of mass membership organizations. Uh, and I think that, that the story he tells is, is not as uh, 
nuanced as it ought to be, but you may have run across this uh, in a book by Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone, in which he bemoans this decline of, of sort of mass membership organizations. Uh, I think that decline is real in a lot of ways, and it does reflect uh, weakened institutional ability for large groups of poor and working people to exert pressure on the economic and political systems. All right. So this uh, is uh, another summary, sort of the same kind of issue from an economist called Gerald Ber uh, Jared Bernstein. Excuse me, he used to be uh, the economic advisor under then Vice President uh, Joe Biden uh, and was an economist before and continues to be an economist afterwards at the Economic Policy Institute. And you can pause here and take a look. Here's his explanation. You can see there's a lot of overlap here, right? What I've articulated is a fairly common kind of way of explaining this, this post-World post War II trend. And here's yet another analysis. And maybe pause and read that and then come back. So notice two things here, right? First, among careful analysts, there really is a common set of explanations for what has happened to return us such to such historically high levels of inequality. And uh, as a scholar, right, that, that to me matters, right? When I see large numbers of sort of serious analysts across multiple disciplines converging on similar kinds of explanations, using different data sets, using different methods, and so on, that tends to uh, uh, increase my propensity to trust those kinds of explanations, right? We've got lots of people from multiple traditions converging on a similar set of explanations. That increases the likelihood that I'm going to say, yeah, that's pretty credible, right? So that's thing one. Notice the convergence of how people are thinking about this and explaining it. Second, notice also there's nobody who gives this any serious thought who thinks there's a simple single cause, right? It's a whole host of developments. Some of them are related to each other, to be sure, but it's a whole host of different things that combine to bring us to this pass. But by now, I am hoping that you are reasonably comfortable with that kind of complexity. And you should recognize that if the problems are complex and multifaceted, then the solutions are almost inevitably going to be difficult and they're going to be varied. It's unlikely that there is some single bullet, some single change that we could make that would magically improve the well-being today and future prospects of poor, low-income, working-class, and middle-class Americans. So let's burrow into a couple of these pieces and just play them out a little bit so that we can talk about sort of the, the, the institutional constraints to enacting that kind of change. Uh, one is that lately, and again, if you look at, at this period here from the mid-1800s, uh, Republicans have been more consistently in control of national policymaking institutions, and all else equal, they are more likely to make policies that benefit their wealthier, whiter constituencies more than Democrats generally are. Uh, and Democrats are all else equal, right? Magic words for there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, a little more likely to benefit their economically and racially diverse coalitions, right? So that's one way these changes have come to pass is sheer political control of institutions, right? Who's running things matters, unsurprisingly. And the party that controls those institutions is itself, right? The Republican Party, just as the Democratic Party is not the Democratic Party that it used to be, the Republican Party is not the Republican Party that it used to be. And the Republican Party that disproportionately has controlled those institutions is much more conservative than it has been in the past, causing a greater divide between the parties and making it even harder to achieve consensus. A dynamic, it's important to note, has been playing out at the state level, too disproportionate Republican control, and those Republican parties are disproportionately more conservative than they have been in the past. And again, you can see that partisan breakdown here. But it's not just the ability to make laws that matters, and this is a, another argument that Hacker and Pearson emphasize. It's the ability to stop the other party from enacting policy. Obstruction and delay are themselves forms of policymaking. And those kinds of tactics are easier in the US policymaking system than they are in other nations. This is hugely important, right? Your party may not have enough votes to lower the minimum wage, say, but if you are patient, you may not need to do that. Instead, just use your 
minority or majority power to obstruct, to stop the other party from raising the minimum wage to keep pace with inflation. And if you can do this for long enough, you achieve the same goal without having to enact any new policies whatsoever. In this way, you can weaken the power of social welfare programs without having to do a thing. Just obstruct. Stop programs from keeping up with changes in the world or with inflation, and those programs will erode over time. So let me just click through a couple of other key factors here. Uh, first, there is more inequality because tax rates on the wealthiest Americans have been cut pretty drastically. You've seen this in the past. You can see this here. While at the same time, the salary and benefits going to CEOs have increased pretty dramatically. At the same time, the tax on them has decreased. At the same time as all of that, the number of workers who belong to a union has declined, as I've mentioned, weakening not just their power in the workplace, but this is really important, their power in politics too. Since unions used to have power in part because they could mobilize voters. Meanwhile, those wealthier individuals and corporate interests, because they can afford to, vastly outspend interests that are representing poor and low-income people in trying to influence the policymaking process. And they are, of course, much more likely to be able to help fund what are increasingly radically expensive presidential campaigns. And I apologize, it looks like I've got some outdated data here, but this trend just continues and will continue as we look forward. Wealthier people are more likely to vote, too, which gives yet another reason for candidates and elected officials to tend more to their concerns, right? They're more likely to give them money, they're more likely to show up and vote. Because of these dynamics altogether, members of Congress themselves are much wealthier than they used to be. This is looking at their richest in 2014 going state by state, right? They're just members of Congress. To go along with this, of course, there are fewer working class people who find themselves in positions of national political power and not unreasonable, I think, to wonder whether that means the interests of working class people are less likely to be rec recognized and represented in those national institutions. And while there's been progress, right, women and people of color continue to be greatly underrepresented. And that matters altogether, right? Not just because wealthier interests have more influence in the policymaking process, because they want different things than other groups do. It's a pattern that plays out similarly with voters and with non-voters. And again, this marks us as an outlier, right? In the U.S., unlike other rich democracies, wealthier people are much more likely to support cuts to programs that benefit lower-income groups. This is not necessarily true in other rich countries. So taken together, all of this gives us national policymaking institutions that are unresponsive not only to the needs and desires of poor and low-income people, but of middle-class Americans as well. The more higher-income people support a particular policy change, the more likely it is that that change will happen. That's all to the good, right? It's a mark of democratic responsiveness. But the more low-income people who support a particular policy has no effect whatsoever on the likelihood that it will be enacted. And as you see that blue line in the chart on the right, that's showing us the same lack of responsiveness true even for middle-income people. The larger the share of middle-income people who favor a particular policy change, no impact whatsoever on the likelihood that it will be enacted. This is another study that comes to the same conclusion. This is arguably a crisis of democracy as much as it is an economic crisis. And, and this unresponsiveness, right, this is not lost on the public. People aren't generally stupid about these kinds of things. And that's, I think, one of the ways that we expect, we explain, excuse me, that the population popularity of the U.S. Congress has reached historically low levels. It's even worse than people think in lots of ways. Here's, here's one way to show what people think is going on in terms of income and wealth inequality. Excuse me, this is just looking at wealth inequality and what the reality is. I think this is one of the challenges we need to think about, right, is 
Recognize that this decline in trust may be rational, but think about what we do about that. 